Beautiful song. Thank you, Joe. Didn't you appreciate the strings this morning with the violin and the cello? Beautiful music. Well, um, thank you for sliding on in on the ice today. How many of you, when you got here, the parking lot was icy? So that's why you guys, some of, most, most of you came after the ice. And I think a lot of people stayed home because they fought maybe that it was icy, but you are the ones who waited out. It's going to be like in the 40s today. How many are you happy? <laughs> pastor Weaver, our fearless leader, senior pastor, uh, took off and went to warmer ground. He bailed on us. He's in Texas. Morning, Pastor Weaver. <laughs> He's uh, visiting his mother who is not in good health and uh, so... Be in prayer for them as he's there spending time with his mom and uh, catching a few Baylor events while he's in, while he's in Waco. So I love our pastor and miss him when he's not here and uh, so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, this morning when you walked in, uh, you may have saw that there's a table. We did a ministry fair a few weeks ago and we had like 27 different volunteer ministries uh, represented in the foyer. Uh, So thankful for so many people who uh, volunteered for that. If you haven't heard from a ministry team leader, just hold on. We we had an overwhelming response, and a few of those ministry leaders have different things going on in their their own personal lives that, you know, maybe just haven't had a chance to get in contact with you. Uh, But this morning, we're highlighting a ministry that we hadn't included during that, and that is a, a prayer ministry team. And uh, we want as many people as, as will uh, volunteer for this. Not something that you even say, well, I'm just not a great prayer. If you would volunteer just to say, I'll be part of some uh, prayer uh, team, prayer event that's going on at the church. We uh, have a Saturday morning prayer time. We did that yesterday morning from 9 to 10 and uh, had, a, had a tremendous time of prayer with those that were here. Uh, We're also going to be doing a prayer at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, as well as um, we have uh, an intercessory uh, 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 or a team that prays here during the services when we have times of prayer at the altar. And so if you want to be part of any of those types of prayer teams, uh, it might stretch some of you a little bit. But here's the deal. We're all, uh, as Christians, believers, there's not one of us that has a, a greater uh, ability or pipeline than anybody else. We all have access to God. And uh, it doesn't matter if you say, well, I've just been a Christian for a few weeks, a few days, a few months. It doesn't really matter. Uh, a, a prayer offered in faith can make a sick person well, James says. And it doesn't matter who that is. It doesn't have to be a pastor. It doesn't have to be a prayer warrior. It can be anybody who would be willing as a vessel to reach out and pray and affect change in a person's life because it's not about us. We're going to be talking about prayer this morning. It's, it's really about God, and his abilities are limitless. So he can, use, he can use anyone. He can use someone who is willing and surrendered and just a vessel. So uh, there's also a, a, a pastor's prayer team. We had uh, prayer circles for a period of time. Each pastor had a, a team of people. But we're going to try to build a team of about 100, at least 100 people that would say, I will be uh, willing to be part of a pastor, the pastor prayer team. We'll communicate through email uh, weekly, maybe even a few times during the week of different prayer things that come up, and that would be a, an army of people who would just be on call willing to pray uh, when, when something's going on. So uh, we'd love to have 100 people uh, doing that, but all these other uh, opportunities, I encourage you to stop by the table this morning. I may talk about it a little more at the end, but uh, all of you are encouraged. Uh, students, middle school, high schoolers, we need you too. Uh, don't feel like you're, you're, you're unqualified. Everyone here is qualified, and we encourage all of you to consider being part of a prayer ministry team. No uh, experience required ahead of time, just a willing person. So, so this morning, speaking on prayer, turn in your Bibles to Colossians. We're going to be uh, reading a, uh, just a, a verse there in Colossians. We'll come back to it a few times. There'll be a few other places I may have you turn. Uh, but as I was considering just a, uh, a, a one-time message on prayer today, we're in a series on the basics. We've covered water baptism and communion today, prayer. I believe Pastor Hawkins is going to be sharing next week on the Word. Uh, you know, someone said if the Word is really is likened to in the Scripture as, as food for us, uh, prayer is, is breath. It's our breath. Um, but we're in this series on the basics. And so as I'm thinking, what do I share in a, in a, in a message on a one Sunday morning about prayer? 
Um, really what I want to do this morning, uh, more than just teach you theology of prayer, uh, is really just to hopefully try to inspire, to motivate uh, all of us uh, with a little bit of inspiration uh, to just simply pray. Because we all can pray, we all need to, need to pray. You know, I have not heard one person in my life ever uh, make this statement. There's a, we may make this statement about a lot of different things in life. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, usually it happens at the first of the year when we're making resolutions of what we're going to do, but there's do or not do, and there's sometimes we come to this place and say, you know what, I, I really just need to cut back in this area of my life. Because maybe things have gotten out of balance. Maybe you're spending too much time with, with this particular thing or, or whatever. Maybe it's your time on the internet or watching TV or whatever it might be. You might say, Ab said, I'm just going to, I need to really seriously cut back in this area. But I've never heard anyone say, you know, I've been, I, lately I've just been praying a, way too much. And it's really an area in my life that I just need to cut back on and do a lot less. Said no one ever. I realize in a, in a group like this, you know, there's a variety of different um, places that we're coming from in life, in our, in our journey as a Christian, in our relationship with the Lord, and there be, like I said, some who uh, just been following Jesus for a few days, a few weeks, uh, some who have uh, decades of, of time and history with the Lord, and so, um, and, and that isn't even necessarily uh, uh, an indication of where we're at in our relationship with the Lord, but... Um, I would guess that uh, the vast majority of us here, if not all of us, uh, would say no matter where we're at in that relationship, my prayer life could be better. How many of you would say that's you? I mean, just, just to raise your hand. If there's one area in my life that could be better, it would be my time with the Lord and the time that I spend in prayer. So we're all in this together, okay? And I realize that uh, if that's the case, uh, hopefully we can inspire a little bit today, motivate. But what I don't want you to hear and what I don't want you to walk away this morning with this idea that I'm just a horrible Christian, I don't do enough, I can't pray enough, I'm not good enough. Please don't hear that. What I want us to, to take away today is the fact that we can connect with God. We need to connect with God individually and as a church and so that's kind of where we're going this morning. Uh, author, uh, theologian F.B. Meyer said this, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. The fact that we don't pray. Instead of prayer being something that we do every day, like our breathing or our eating or walking or talking, it's become like that little glass box that hangs on the wall that, that has a little uh, sign on it that says, break in case of an emergency. That's kind of how prayer uh, happens in a lot of people's lives. Only when I find myself in a place uh, where something tragic has happened do I reach out and connect with the Lord. Prayer is, for the most part, an untapped resource. And if we would all dig in a little more and pursue a little bit more in, in that communication with God, I believe uh, that we would see an absolute outpouring of God's spirit and power and see things happen in the midst of us in our own lives of healing and of restoration uh, that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Maybe some of us never seen. And uh, we, we uh, together can affect that change, not because of us, not because of how we pray, not because of the words that we say, uh, we're going to find because it's, it's about God and his ability and his power. Prayer is one of those things that's probably talked more about in Christianity than anything else and practiced less than anything else. The Apostle Paul understood uh, prayer and his power, and he, it was part of his life, and he believed that it should be part of every believer. Every person that follows after Christ needs to pray. But how many of you would agree you can't have a good marriage if you rarely ever talk to your spouse? You're not going to have a great marriage if you rarely talk to your, to your wife or to your husband. Now, you can be a Christian and not pray, just like you can be married and never talk to your wife. But in both circumstances, you're going to be absolutely miserable because it just doesn't work that way. Prayer is a pipeline of communication between God and us. 
And that, and that pipeline is open if we will just pursue that. And so a few things that I want to talk about prayer this morning. The first one is this, that in our praying, we need to pray with persistence. Paul says, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, you turned there a few minutes ago. Just the first part of that verse says this, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. New King James Version says, continue earnestly in prayer. It means to persist in, to adhere firmly to, to um, remain devoted to. It really is about dedication. He's saying, dedicate yourselves to prayer. We need to dedicate, commit ourselves, be devoted to prayer. It's an imperative or, or, or a command. In other words, persistence in prayer is not optional. It's a command from the Lord himself. They're two of the most instructive parables that Jesus ever taught on on prayer. One's found in Luke uh, chapter 11, the other in Luke chapter 18. Uh, And both of them have to do with being persistent uh, in in, uh, not giving up in prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse 9, we have this promise where Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Probably a more accurate uh, translation of, of that might be this. Ask, and keep on asking. Seek, and keep on seeking. Knock, and keep on knocking. And, the, and, the, and, and Jesus says, and it will be done for you. He doesn't want us to give up in prayer. He wants us to be persistent. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, It says this, one day Jesus told his disciples a story, a parable, to show that they should always pray and never give up. We should always pray and never give up praying. But all of us say, you know what, I know that I could do better. I know that that's one area in my life that's lacking. I know that that's something that I would love in my life, that it would be greater than what it is right now. Jesus says, Be persistent. Keep on praying and never give up. Some people give up way too easy. And some people give up way too easy with a lot of things. But we give up in this this pursuit of prayer because there's a lot of times, honestly, if you're honest, we just don't feel like it. Why is it that we feel more like turning on a TV and sitting there and just watching just nonsense on on a TV screen but we'll, we'll do that instead of taking time just to be with the Lord. Why is it that we pursue so many other things and we don't pursue the thing that is the most important? I, I believe the reason is, and, I know, and as a matter of fact, I know the reason is, is we, we have an enemy in this life and what he's, he's pretty strategic. He would love nothing more than to distract us, to get our mind where it shouldn't be, to get our life heading in a direction where uh, it shouldn't go, rather than the place that we need to go, okay? So there's way too many options, way too many things, way too much stuff for us to be involved in, but it takes up our time with the Lord. So we quit because we don't feel like it. We just say the joy is gone. We don't have the feelings. Uh, But the reality is, is we just don't, we, we cannot live by our feelings. We cannot live by our emotions. You've lived long enough that you know the fact that your emotions on any given day can be all over the map up one minute, down the next, all based on circumstances that are going on, and not just necessarily with you, but with everything else that's going on around you. And so if we're living by our feelings, we're on a roller coaster ride. We're getting jerked around, tossed around. Life is happening. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We cannot live by our emotions. We have to live by what we know is true and by what God has told us and what he has commanded us to do, and he tells us to pray without ceasing. George Mueller, you may have heard of this man. How many of you have heard of George Mueller? Uh, Famous evangelist, missionary uh, that lived in the 1800s. So he he was born in 1805, died in 1898. So he lived almost that whole century there. One of the greatest men of prayer and faith probably since the days of the New Testament. Here's a man that if you haven't heard of him or you haven't read anything about him, I'd encourage you to look up some articles or get, there's books uh, that, that, uh, Uh, talk about some of his uh, experiences in life. Um, But he's probably best known for orphanages that he he built. 
Uh, during a time in England in the 1800s, the most orphans uh, were living uh, in, uh, on the street, working in uh, workhouses, sweat houses, uh, much like Oliver Twist in the Charles Dickens story. Uh, Mueller felt led by the Lord to start orphanages, and he took these children, these street children in, he fed them, he clothed them, and he educated them. He cared for as many as 2,000 kids at one time, and over the course of his years of ministry, more than 10,000 kids came through his orphanage. Yet never once did he ever ask a single person about a need that he had in his orphanage. Never asked for money, never said one thing to one person ever. Of everything that he ever needed, he only prayed about it, and God supplied everything that he had. He has, in a, in a, in a book, in his journals, over 50,000 specific recorded answers to prayer. 30,000 of which were answered either the same day or within the same hour that he prayed the prayer. If you think about that, that's 500 definite answers to prayer in one year. So that's more than one a day uh, for uh, every single day for 60 years. And literally, in, in today's currency, over a half a billion dollars flowed through his ministry. And never once did he ever stand up in front of uh, a, a crowd or talk to one person and said, this is really what I need. He only took it to the Lord in prayer. One, one story, there's, there's too much, not enough time to tell some of these stories, but here's, here's one story. It says, uh, their children were dressed and ready for school one morning, but there was no food for them to eat. This is what the uh, house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. And so he asked her to take all 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. So they're dressed, ready for school, ready to eat breakfast, but the only problem is there's no food. There's no food in the house. So George has them sit at the tables, and he thanked God for the food, and then they waited. You see, he knew that God was going to provide, because he always had. And within minutes, there was a knock on the door. The baker knocked on his door, and he said, Mr. Mueller, last night I couldn't sleep. Somehow I just knew that today you would need some bread, and so I went to my shop, and I've baked three batches of bread uh, for you. Could you use those today? And he said, absolutely. As soon as they got the bread in, started serving the kids, there was another knock on the door. It was the milkman. His milk cart had broken down in front of the orphanage, and uh, he knew that in the time that it would take to get uh, the, the wheel repaired on his cart, that the milk would spoil. So he said, could you use, could you use some milk? And they brought in 10 uh, big... Uh, containers of milk, just enough to feed 300 thirsty children. Story after story, day after day, hour after hour, he prayed, and God answered his prayers immediately. How many of you would love that to be the case? It's not about George Mueller. George Mueller wasn't anyone spectacular other than he had faith in God and believed God for, for miraculous things. George Mueller said this about being persistent in prayer. He said, it's a common temptation of Satan to make us give up reading the word uh, and, and prayer when our enjoyment is gone. As if it were no use to read the scriptures when we don't enjoy them. And as if it were no use to pray when we have no spirit to pray. The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we have to continue to read it. The way we obtain the spirit of prayer is that we continue praying. The less that we read of the word of God, the less we desire to read it. The less we desire to pray, or the less we pray, the less we desire to pray. And so when we say, you know, I'm just not feeling it, hey, you know what, we don't operate by our feelings anyway. We do what we know is true, and Jesus said, be persistent in your prayer. You ought to always pray and never give up. Be persistent in your prayer. The second thing is this. When you pray, pray with passion. Stands the reason that if you are persistent about something, you're probably going to be passionate about it. Something that you are pursuing and you're not giving up, you will build a passion for that thing. Jesus was passionate about his prayer life. It was something that he was always doing. You can read through the Gospels and you find all the time where Jesus would get away to a time where he could be alone and pray. He was always getting alone to pray. And he prayed with passion because he knew 
who it was that he was talking to. And he knew that prayer to the Father was a powerful thing. See, passionate prayer is a prayer from our heart. It's a prayer from our heart, not just, not just our head. It's how Jesus taught us to pray, uh, not only in his example, and, but it's through his teaching. In Matthew 6, we have the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus instructs on prayer. And it's here that we find the Lord's Prayer. But just before the Lord's Prayer, uh, I don't know how many of you remember what he said. What was it that he said before he gave instruction on this is how to pray? He said, when you pray, don't use meaningless reputation, repetition. Rep, repetition. Don't use reputation either. That's, <laughs> don't use meaningless rep, repetition. You have to say repetition five times and then you're being repetitive and don't do that. That's... Another version says this, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. So, for instance, like this, if we talked about communicating with our wives, husbands, uh, you wouldn't say to your wife, oh, honey, I love you. I, I really love you. I mean, I just want to tell you today that you're loved by me. I mean, I love you, and I'm so glad that I have this time just to say, I love you. And I wouldn't address my wife as genie wife. Oh, genie wife. I, you know, when I say her name once, usually I have her attention. If she says my name, um, I'm in trouble usually. <laughs> Actually, she doesn't even have to say my name. If I looked over here at my wife, you can, my, you can kind of keep an eye on her, but there's times where she'll go. And she's talking to me. Or maybe just a little while, she may just do one of these. (laughs) She's the only one that can do that, okay? (laughs) So she doesn't have to use my... But why is it that we would just go on and on and on? So I love you. I just want to say I love you. I'm so glad that I have this time just to to say I love you and that you're loved by me. And and oh, by the way, please feed the children and clean the kitchen and and the rest of the house. And and, uh, may all go well with you. Amen. Does this sound like good communication? No. But yet that's what our prayer often, uh, it, it's just a repetition. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. We're talking about praying passionate prayers. being Praying with passion. The, the amplified version says it like this, The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. When put into action and made effective by God, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. He goes on from that verse to talk about Elijah, to speak about Elijah, and uses Elijah as an example. And he talks about Elijah being a human being, even as we are, having a nature just like us. Elijah uh, is referring back to 1 Kings where he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain And you remember the story that for three and a half years it stopped raining until he prayed passionately again that it would rain and the rain rain came. So we have a a, a real misunderstanding with this verse in James chapter 5 verse 16 that says the, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Because here's what most of us hear. What do you, what one word do you hear out of this verse? You hear righteous. And, and, you, and you make your conclusions based on that. See, we too easily miss the main ingredient of effective prayer. It's sin that rewires us to focus on ourselves. But prayer is not at all about us. The main ingredient of effective prayer is emphatically not you. It's not me. It's not us. The, righteous, the prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. Different ways that that verse is said. But um, it's commonly misunderstood like this. Be righteous and your prayers will work. That's not what that verse is saying. You see, we make the burden of the passage something to do with us and think that if we want our prayers to be effective, then we've got to somehow reach some level of righteousness. 
You know, James is talking about, uh, the, the whole point is that prayer is effective. He asks some questions before this. He says, is any of you suffering? What should you do? Pray. If any of you is sick, if any of you has sin, in each case, he tells the readers to pray. Why? Because prayer is effective. Because God hears the prayers of his people and he acts on their behalf. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. The concern is not how prayer is made effective, but that prayer is effective. The whole fact that prayer is effective. So in verse 17, as he talks about Elijah and says that he was a man, he was like us, and he prayed fervently. What does Elijah have to do with our praying? Does it mean that Elijah was righteous and his prayers worked? So we should be like Elijah for our prayers to work? Because if you've read anything about Elijah, you know Elijah did some amazing exploits. And you're thinking of him as more like a, a superpower, a superhuman, a superhero. And, uh, and honestly, that's not, that's not the point here. Uh, James is saying he was, he was a man just like us. He had a human nature just like us. He, he, being just a man, being like us, having a nature like ours, he prayed fervently and God, and God heard. So he's saying, look, Elijah was a person. He was a human being. He had a human nature, just like us. And yet still, Elijah prayed fervently, and God heard, and God answered. So the point isn't that we should be righteous at an extraordinary level of Elijah, uh, but that he was normal, and I say that word loosely, normal, like you and me. Not like me. I'm not normal. Everybody said amen. Thank you for your words of encouragement there. <laughs> Elijah was just normal. It does, James doesn't say for us to be like Elijah for our prayers to be answered, but Elijah was just like us, and his prayers were answered. Therefore, we ought to pray. The focus of effective prayer is not us. The focus of effective prayer is God himself. It has less to do with the specifics of how we say what we say and more to do with to whom we're saying it. So if you think, okay, I can't pray because I can't string five words together and make it sound like anything, big deal. I think God can interpret a five-word prayer to know exactly what you're trying to say. Paul actually says there's times when the Spirit prays through us and it just comes out like a groan. But he knows exactly what we need. So it doesn't matter the words that you use or the posture that you have because there's all kinds of postures. And just a groan gets God's attention and he knows exactly what you need and he has the ability to do something about it. So prayer is effective not because of great men who pray, but because of a great God who graciously hears his people. He is the main ingredient of effective prayer. It's God's power at work, not our righteousness. It's not our ability. We're not good enough. None of us are. Hear me this morning. It's not about you. It's not about your ability to pray. It's not about your righteousness. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, according to his power, according to the power of his Holy Spirit that lives in us. God is able. And he is able to do everything. You see, that verse would be enough if it said, he is able to do all that we ask or even think. But Paul takes it a, a, a step above that. He says, he's able to do above all. If, if this is all, he's able to do above all. And not only that, he says, he's able to do abundantly above all. However much that is. And beyond that, he says, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power. Not according to my words, not according to my faith, not according to my ability, according to his power that's at work in me. It's quiet in here. Three amens. It's true. 
He's able to do immeasurably, infinitely more. It's all about him. And so we pray with passion because we know it has nothing to do with us. We are passionate about a God who's passionate about us. We're passionate about a God who can do exceedingly abundantly, infinitely more than anything we can imagine in our wildest dreams. God can do that. That will make you pray with passion. The third thing is, as we pray, we, we pray persistently, we pray per- passionately, and we pray with thankfulness. Paul said, Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I love the New Living Translation in this verse best. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. What do we worry about? Why do we worry? If we've got a God who is on our side, who is available to us, who can do above all, not only that, he can do abundantly above all, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all, why are we worrying about anything? Can someone give me a good answer? (laughs) We are human, we're very human. And God is not human at all. He's beyond our mind, imagination. He's great. He's big. He's powerful. He's able. And uh, we worry about too much. And Scripture tells us don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Just pray about it. Why aren't we praying? We're to be persistent. Pray always. Pray about everything. There's not a lot of room to do much else. We should be praying about it all. And I'm not saying you got to walk around just, oh, uh, you know, just talking in prayer all the time. You're just connected with God. Certainly there's time for us to spend in prayer with God alone. But throughout our day, there's times and places where, you know, we can just talk to God. It's like we're online all the time, and he can, he can speak to us anytime he, uh, he needs to, and we can speak to him anytime we need to. We just stay online with him. Do we get that terminology? We're always online. We're no longer on dial-up with God. High speed, all the way. We're to give thanks in our praying. Tell God what you need and thank him for everything that he's done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you, to be thankful in all circumstances. Not to thank him for everything, but be thankful in everything. If you back up to the verse before that, what does it say? Never stop praying. Pray unceasingly. Before that, it says, always be joyful. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Give thanks in everything. Pretty simple. Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Why are we to be thankful in our praying? Because being thankful, expressing our gratitude, does a lot of things. I think of when my children will say, uh, thank you for things. It's my son Ethan sitting here. Eli, are you awake over there? He's, he's not. Okay. Um, if they were to come and say thank you to me for something, you know what that does to me? As a parent, you, those of you that are parents and your children express thanks, you know what they're saying? You know what? I need you. And I appreciate the fact that you take care of me and you think of me and you took care of these things. You know what, whether they say thank you or not, I'm not gonna stop caring. And that's the fact with God too, but there's something that happens in us when we're thankful and we express our thanks and live thankfully before the Lord. He's not gonna stop taking care of us, but are we gonna take him for granted like that? Are we gonna appreciate the fact that, uh, that, that he's there and he's taking care of us? Everything that we have, everything that we do, uh, he's, he's, he's providing for us and taking care of us. So expressing our gratitude and being thankful articulates our dependence on God. It's worth saying, God, I need you. I can't, I can't do it without you. Thank you for taking care of me because I can't take care of myself. Thank you for, for looking out for me because I can't see things that you see. I don't know the things that you know. Thank you for being faithful and being there and never, never leaving. It articulates our dependence on him. It demonstrates our relationship with him. 
We're thanking him because we're in relationship, because of that love, because of his care. And it also communicates the proper attitude that we ought to have. Thankfulness is a proper attitude. That's the proper thing for us to do is just be thankful, if nothing else. And what it does is generate humility in us. So pray with thankfulness. Be thankful. The last thing is this. Um, in our prayer, uh, making intercession. Intercessory prayer is basically praying for others. It's, it's praying for God's will to be done in the lives of other people. Uh, intercessory prayer was characterized in the prayer life of Jesus. You can look at uh, uh, all through the Gospels of Jesus' life here on earth. Luke twenty two thirty two. 32, Jesus tells Peter, he says, Peter, I've pleaded in prayer for you that your faith wouldn't fail. He's interceding for Peter. On the cross, Jesus prayed. What did he say? Father, forgive them. for They don't know what they're doing. He's making intercession for, for, for all those who were, who were, who were there. Romans 8.34 tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So his example of interceding and praying for us, Hebrews 7.25, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. God is constantly interceding in prayer for us. There's people here, I know that you pray for us as pastors. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so appreciative of that. But how much more great would it be to know, for you to know that Jesus is always praying for you? The one who can affect change in your life, the one who we're praying to, is actually praying for you and interceding on your behalf. So thankful for for his example for us. Back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, he says, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I, as I should. He understood, understanding the power of prayer. Paul's saying, pray for, pray for me. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart and pray for a specific purpose. He wanted them to pray for him. He wanted them to pray that God would open a door, that he could speak about the gospel. Pray that God would give us opportunity. Notice that he's not praying, what he's not praying is about for himself as far as his personal situation and circumstances. He's not praying for, for his legal situation or that he'd be released from prison. He's saying, pray for me while I'm here that God would open a door, that I'd be faithful to speak and talk about the gospel and that lives would be changed while I'm here. How much of our prayer time is dedicated to the expansion of God's kingdom versus how much of our prayer time is the expansion of our own kingdom? Are we praying more about ourself, for ourself, or are we praying for God's kingdom as a whole? One last story here as the, as the musicians would come. Howard Hendricks is an author some of you guys might have heard him at a Promise Keepers event over uh, some time ago. He's a longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he shares a story. He says, years ago in our church in Dallas, we were having trouble finding a teacher for a junior high boys class. The list of prospects had only one name. And when they told me who it was, I said, you've got to be kidding. But I couldn't have been more wrong about that young man. He took the class and revolutionized it. I was so impressed that I invited him to my home for lunch and asked him the secret of of his success. And he pulled out of his pocket a little black book. And on each page, he had a small picture of one of the boys. And under that boy's name were comments like, having trouble in math, or he comes to church against his parents' wishes, or we'd like to be a missionary someday but doesn't think he has what it takes. He said, I pray over those pages every day. And I can hardly wait to come to church on, uh, on uh, each Sunday to see what God has been doing in their lives. How many this week you've had someone share something that's going on in their life and you've said something like, I'll pray for you. Any, any of you had something like that this week that happened? How often have you said, I'll pray for you 
and you walked away like you forget a lot, a lot of other things. And it's not that you intended to forget. It's not that you intended not to pray, but you forget. I'm looking for someone that's here. I don't know that they're here today, but there's a, a gentleman here at church. And I know there's a lot of people that pray. And I'm thinking about a, a, a situation where um, I had shared something and he had been praying for this and periodically would ask me, how's it going? Okay. And uh, a long time went by and brought this thing up again and uh, that he was praying for me about. And I honestly had forgot about this situation completely. You know, like something happened and I moved on and moved on and it wasn't a thought in my mind. Well, because he was faithful to pray, he was still praying for this situation. And finally I said, oh yeah, let me tell you what happened. I'm so thankful for someone who would be faithful to do that. And I'm so guilty, even as your pastor, and I'm not saying that I don't pray for you. There's times where I may forget. But how many of you would say, I don't want to forget? You see, if I'd have thought about this in time, I would have ordered 2,000 little spiral notebooks that you could carry around and start thinking about this. Every time you have a conversation, to write, write that prayer down and then, and then live by that and, and actually pray for one another. And, and, I'm, and I'm seeing this, and this is what I thought. We, we carry notebooks around with us everywhere we go. Most all of us have something that we can c- keep a note on. You've got n- little notepads. There's actually an app that I found yesterday, and I don't really know how, how good it is, but it's just about this, about, um, it's a prayer mate where you can put prayer requests for your family, for your friends, for your church, for your small group, and you can just organize them however you want to, and that stuff comes up whenever you access it, or it'll just bring them up randomly through your day. You get a notification and you can pray in that moment. You don't have to go into a closet on your knees to pray about that one situation. Just pray. God hears you. He's always online. He will always hear you when you pray and he'll answer you. Sometimes I think we don't become what God wants us to become because we're too focused on ourselves and not on others. See, when we pray for others, we become more like Jesus. And when we become more like Jesus, God grows more in us. He grows us more, He shows us more, and He uses us more. The reality is, we've got to pray. We have to pray. Be persistent in your prayer and don't give up. I wonder this morning how many of you, we're going to just end this morning by praying. I wonder how many of you would say, You know, if we're praying for each other, some of you in the room maybe have some situation that you're facing that isn't overwhelming, something that you can't even put into words, a situation that you're facing that you need prayer for. How many of you say that's you? I want to ask if that's you this morning, if you would just stand. Everybody's looking around, okay, because we're a family. We can't be ashamed or embarrassed or afraid of what what we're going through. We need each other. We need prayer. Some of you are facing something and you're going, you know what, My, mine isn't that big of a deal. But you know what, it matters to God. Something that you, that you honestly, if you're honest about it, you've, you've worried about it. Something that's consumed your mind, you've thought about it. You haven't necessarily been maybe praying a little bit about it, but you're worrying about it. Scripture tells us don't worry about anything pray about everything and you say well my need doesn't seem huge and overwhelming to me but you do have a need that you need prayer that would if somebody else would join you in prayer you'd say I'll take that prayer if that's you just stand up it doesn't have to be a huge thing it's just something in your life that is something that is that is you just need an answer to prayer for might be you might be a family member might be a situation I don't know it's just something that 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 you want to offer to the Lord in prayer a hymn that we sing about um, a friend that we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 
peace we often forfeit, needless pain we bear because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We trials, have we temptations, trouble, take it to the Lord in prayer. He knows our every weakness, take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak, heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. I want us to end this morning by praying. All of us in this room can pray. And I want you to, if you're standing, I'd invite you to come and just stand across the front. We have a prayer team, and we're developing a prayer team for this service. We have a lot of people who will come and pray in the early service, but not as many in this service. And so one of those places to check, and Jerry, Mary Beth and Jesse, you lead that up. But I'm just saying, if here we believe that anybody can be led by God to pray for somebody else. So as we sing this morning and you've got a need and you come, I'm going to come myself and I'm just going to stand here because I, I have a need in my own life. And so if you've got a need and it's, maybe it's overwhelming or it just seems simple, but you just say, I want to give it to God and just, and just put it in his court. And you just come across the front and you just stand here. Nobody's going to ask you what your stuff is. Nobody's going to do anything like that. We're just going to pray for you. And that's how we're going to end. Would you stand to everybody across the room? And if you got a need, I just encourage you to come down here. And if you feel led to pray with somebody, just come. You can just put a hand on their shoulder. You can pray for them, stand with them, believe with them, and ask God on their behalf, intercede with them. And let's see God do amazing things.